In those days, God delivered all these commandments. I, the Lord, am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. You shall not have other gods besides me. You shall not carve idols for yourselves in the shape of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down before them. Take me down to the third and fourth generation but bestowing mercy down to the thousandth generation on the children of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord you will leave un for the Lord will not leave unpunished him who takes his name in vain. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Six days you may labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God you. In six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord has blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that you may have a long life in the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife nor as male or female slave, nor as ox or ass, nor anything else that belongs to him. <clears throat> the word of the Lord. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true, all of them just. <coughs> they are more pre precious than gold than a heap of purest gold, sweeter also than syrup or honey from the comb. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Blessed are they who have kept the word with a generous heart and yield the harvest through perseverance. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Dominus is the one who hears the word and receives it at once with joy. But he has no root and lasts only for a time. When some tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. The seed sown among the thorns is the one who hears the word, but then worldly anxiety and the lures of riches choke the word and bears no fruit. But the seed sown on rich soil is the one who hears the word of God and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields a hundred or sixty or thirty fold. Verbum Domini. All right, please be seated. All right, so those watching at home, you can see another house mass in Ireland, beautiful countryside of Ireland, Northern Ireland. I'm still up in the north. Uh, and uh, just another blessing to be able to celebrate a house mass. We're celebrating a house mass today, another house mass tomorrow. And, uh, and then uh, we move back down to the south. And I'll be in Mullingar uh, for uh, Sunday and then heading down to Kerry. I'll be on the Dingle Peninsula and uh, and then to Cork and then to home. So we're in the last 10 days of my trip, this two month trip, which has been filled with many, many blessings. So today I decided uh, and uh, the Magnificat says, all right, that I could have. They suggested the, the uh, prayers of the votive mass of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. 
because it is Friday. I decided, though, to do a votive mass of the mercy of God, the mercy of God. And uh, uh, we offer up this Mass for all of your intentions, the intentions that are here, gathered here for this Mass, this House Mass, for all of your intentions, the one who are watching this live streaming, my intentions. Uh, so while I'm preaching, just call to mind, and as we do the prayers of intercession, the prayers of the faithful, call to mind uh, what you want our Lord to bless during this holy sacrifice of the Mass. Now, uh, I, I could talk at length. Obviously, the first the, the first uh, reading is the Ten Commandments, right? And it's interesting that if you look at the Ten Commandments, they ain't no way Moses fits this on two tablets, right? Uh, there's a, a a lot of explanation in there, all right, in the in the the bequeathing of the Ten Commandments, and of course, our Christian brothers and sisters who are not Catholic come well after the fact. Well, right, I mean, 1,500 years, right, after the fact, they decide that they're going to decide for themselves, right, how these commandments are broken up, and then turn around and claim that the Catholics have it wrong, right? Um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, I guess. But in this case, it's very, very simple. Our, um, our uh, uh, Christian brothers and sisters who are not Catholic, all right, uh, combine the first two commandments. I'm sorry, uh, turn the first two commandments into three commandments and then combine the last two commandments so they still come up with ten. Uh, in Catholicism, of course, uh, we just have Lord the Lord, love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, your whole being, right? And I am the Lord your God. Uh, you shall have no gods before me. And then uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Uh, to fit everything that's here into a commandment doesn't make, uh, it, 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 it's not practical. But of course, they criticize us because they claim that these statues, right? So they claim that right there, that's a, a wall of idolatry, right there. That's a wall of idolatry, the crucifix, Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Blessed Mother, and Joseph and the Child Jesus. That's a wall of idolatry, they would say. It's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous because, all right, he says uh, that you shall not carve idols for yourself in the shape of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath the sea and bow down before them or worship them, Right? So there's a big difference between the golden calf and the Jews worshiping the golden calf and, the, and us having these reminders of the God that we do worship, right? The saints that we do venerate, right? Uh, big difference, right? And they can't get that in their heads. The ones who get it into their heads and understand and the light goes on, all right, they become Catholic, right? Uh, but they obstinately persist in their misunderstanding of uh, our view of, of these images, right? These images. Now, it's interesting, our Christian brothers and sisters have no problem with nativity scenes, right? But they can't even bear to see Jesus hanging on the cross, and and yet there's no, I mean, there's no remedy uh, in the spiritual life greater than gazing upon the crucified Christ. I mean, maybe you can conjure that up in your mind, right? Jesus hanging on the cross. But I will tell you, to the extent that anyone conjures up in their mind the crucified Christ, it's from an image that they have seen either in a movie or maybe in a Catholic church. So our Christian brothers and sisters, all right, who conjure up the crucifixion in their mind, where did that image come from, right? It came from some crucifix that they saw or some some image in a movie or something like that. And, and of course, these things they deplore. And they think, well, you should only conjure these things up in your mind, where, of course, you know, this, this whole idea of, of having these images or reminders of, and of course, in the early church, the stained glass windows was how they taught people the faith, right? Um, 
So this stuff is, is, it's just ridiculous. Their theology is ridiculous. Their mindset is ridiculous. And so in being merciful towards them, we are called to pray for them, right? Pray for them, fast for them, that their minds be enlightened. And of course, so many, I just read the other day that, uh, I forget, there's hundreds of Protestant pastors that become Catholic, uh, every single year. Uh, and of course, because there is no other place for them to go than, than towards the fullness of truth, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It, it, it's interesting that over the last few days, this parable, right, of the, uh, the parable of the sower throwing seeds on the, on the pavement and in the thorns and uh, the thin soil, the rocky soil, then the, the good soil. Uh, Jesus reiterates it. Then there's another version. Then he explains it to his apostles. And, and here we have a further explanation. I, I think that the most important part of this gospel is to understand that we need to be rich soil, that if we are uh, 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 thorny or uh, rocky or uh, shallow, that we can nurture our souls, we can nurture our spiritual life and become rich soil, right? And that we really want to constantly reflect on the different problematic areas, right? The path, the kingdom, the, the path is the one who hears the, the word of the kingdom without understanding it. Do we truly understand the word of God? I just talked about how uh, our Christian brothers and sisters who are not Catholic, do not understand, right? The, 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 uh, the whole idea of the Ten Commandments and uh, the Catholic view of the Ten Commandments and the Catholic view of uh, venerating images or actually images helping us venerate saints or worship God. We don't worship the images. That's ridiculous. Um, and then the seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word of God and receives it at once with joy, but has no roots and lasts only for a time. Um, and we see this a lot, all right, where people come into the faith and they're on fire and then all of a sudden they just uh, kind of like peters out and they fall by the wayside. Why? Because they, they, their faith is built on emotions, on emotions. When we nourish our, nourish our faith, right, it comes from, <clears throat> it starts in the emotions, it, it affects our will, our desire, and then uh, it affects our intellect, right? Three parts of our tripartite soul, our passions, our will, our desire, right? Uh, and, uh, and our intellect, right? St. Thomas Aquinas says our intellect is the understanding of what is good. Once we understand what is good, we desire what is good. And once we understand what is good and desire what is good, then we do the good, right? Uh, and that any one of those three can get corrupted and cause us to fall by the wayside, right? So we have to nourish all three, all three. We have to do the good, practice spiritual exercises, practice works of mercy. And in doing those, and you probably have experienced this in your life, the more good you do, the more you you hunger for the good and you're on fire for the good, right? I mean, like charity is 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 addictive. It's a you know, it's really probably the one compulsive behavior that is a good compulsive behavior, right? Um, and 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 if you continue doing that, then you just come to an understanding that yes, this is the way I should live my life. This is the way I should live my life. <clears throat> and so all of these things, if we're having trouble uh, in our spiritual life, if we don't feel our spiritual life is yielding the 30, the 60, the 100 fold, we need to look and try and analyze uh, spiritually what is going on, what is missing, what are we not doing correctly. Uh, and maybe we might even need some spiritual direction in that regard. As far as the mercy of our Lord, I mentioned in my homily yesterday, 
There's two aspects of God's mercy, and that is that God forgives us our sins, and thus we're called to forgive the sins of others. And indeed, we are to be merciful as our Father is merciful to the extent that our Father forgives us our sins every day. There should be no limit to how often we forgive others, others. And Jesus talks about that throughout Scripture, right? How, how often must we forgive you know, we must forgive seven times, no, seven times 70, right? And then, of course, uh, the other aspect of God's mercy is that we are to share the gifts that our Lord has given us with others. And indeed, Jesus makes it very clear that we're going to be judged in two different ways. At the end of the Our Father, Jesus says, all right, that if you are merciful, you'll be given mercy. And if you don't extend mercy, if you don't forgive others, then neither will your sins be forgiven. And then, of course, Matthew chapter 25, what you did for the least of my brethren, you did for me. What you didn't do for the least of my brethren, you didn't do for me. And that's all about mercy. All right, God gives us good things, and we're called to share those good things with others. Um, and uh, so uh, th this is uh, something that we should reflect on, because in terms of being fertile ground, nurturing our spiritual lives, we cannot have a well-nurtured spiritual life without understanding these two aspects of Christ's mercy and, and, and being merciful, right? Being merciful, uh, being poor in spirit, pure in heart. If you read through the, uh, the Beatitudes, uh, this is the attitude we're called to be. Uh, and, uh, this is what our Lord wants. And again, not in terms of acts that we do, but that it becomes intrinsic in our being. It becomes who we are. <clears throat>